Um, Nora likes Nora likes to start on time because we respect everybody's time, including our speaker. Um, and I would like to welcome everybody to the return of our winter virtual series. We are well on our way. We had Kevin Kelly last uh, Tuesday and oh yeah, lots of lots really of cool stuff. stuff. So I hope that you are continuing no. to sign up and join in. Mm -hmm. um, they, uh, the seed exchange is closed when it comes to ordering seeds or donating seeds, but there is still time to get involved by volunteering to sort and package orders. And yeah, take home a few extra seeds at the end So and get to know people. So if you're fairly new to um, Hardy Plant Society, it's a great way to get to know people. You can go online to learn more about volunteering. Um, our, our grants program, we're very, very proud of it. Now in its 15th year, uh, we have increased our commitment again to support the greater community in gardening. And uh, if you know of a program or a project and you want to encourage them to apply, the deadline is January 31st. They still have a couple days. So please, by all means, finally, uh, well, not finally, what am I saying? Uh, our March into Spring registration is open. If you're a member, this is your opportunity to register at the member's rate of $90. It's landscape challenges. And speaking of landscapes, oh my goodness, we are going to be at Winterthur. And as part of that, the staff of Winterthur is going to, has organized tours of the property at, after this symposium, which ends around three o'clock. So it's a very exciting day for us. We're looking forward to it. Also, we have our online auction uh, that will be part of the event. And um, yeah, I, we hope we see you there. These are the speakers that we will have. Um, this is all about the challenges we face in the landscape. So Uli Lormar is coming down from Garden in the Woods. We have Paul Spriggs, who's going to talk about one of the most challenging landscapes, and that is the crevice garden. Um, as you can see from the slide, yeah, you still can grow gorgeous things. Mike Raup is going to talk to us about the challenges of various and sundry pests. And we are very, very mm -hmm. excited to have Janet and Jeff Crouch, who, um, if you read your New York Times, uh, beat the system. They live in an HOA that didn't like the idea of that lovely native garden. Um, not only has it been accepted, but the laws of Maryland, the state they live in, have been changed to encourage this kind of a landscape. Um, if you haven't been checking our calendar, oh my goodness, we have so many pop-ups. We have workshops. Um, we have a series pop-up at David Culp's Garden, which reflects his uh, Brandywine Cottage book. We have Ken Drews's garden up in North Jersey this coming year as a visit. Uh, many private gardens, nurseries, sales. Um, we have hypertufa workshops coming up. Domestically, we have a lot of trips. We're going to Washington, D.C. in April. Um, unfortunately, you can't sign up for Rhode Island, although you could get on the wait list. Uh, my understanding is that when we opened registration, it filled in 16 minutes. Yikes. Um, in August, we're going to New York City. We'll uh, not do the NYBG. We're going to visit Brooklyn Botanic and the Untermeyer Garden, Wave Hill, some of the lesser visited gardens. And then finally, in September, we hope to go to Sicily and Rome. There is, by the way, on our YouTube channel, uh, of, of footage about the trip. If you're interested, I would suggest you go there to see what's, uh, um, what's happening. Um, and save the date. Our member garden tour is June 29th. It's down in Coatesville and Kennett Square. So we are heading south. At least I am heading south because I'm schlepping down from up here in Princeton, New Jersey. And of course, that speaks to the joy and wonder of the Mid-Atlantic group, because we sprawl across a pretty vast geographic area. And now I'm going to make it very quick. Um, we're so pleased to have Jeff back. Jeff Jabko returns, this time with his considerable knowledge of peonies. 
For those who don't know, he's the director of grounds and coordinator of horticulture for the Scott Arboretum at Swarthmore College. In this role, he oversees the college's 400 acres and the maintenance and development of its plant collections, gardens, and natural areas. He's also an instructor at Longwood Gardens, where he teaches in the Certificate of Ornamental Plants program and the two-year professional horticulture program. Um, we all know that he is uh, very involved in the International Clematis Society. You can say Clematis or Clematis. Um, he is the immediate past president of that organization. And last year, he gave us an amazing program on Clematis. But he is also co-founder and on the executive committee of the Mid-Atlantic Peony Society. He's been named Teacher of the Year uh, by the North American Colleges and Teachers of Agriculture. He was also awarded from up my neck of the woods, the Rutgers Gardens Hamilton Award in 2017. Uh, we are so happy to have you with us, Jeff. I'm gonna stop, share. This is a reminder, folks, as you come up with questions for Jeff, please put them in the chat box and we will review at the end. And I'm handing it over to you now, Jeff. All right, thank you. Let me get set here. There we go. Okay, well, um, thank you for inviting me to do this today. And uh, in the list of all of you attending, I see that there are a number of folks from the uh, Mid-Atlantic Peony Society here. And I'll give you some more information on that later on. But um, for my uh, my talk today, Passion for Peonies, I'm going to go over all different uh, types of peonies, talk about their garden worthiness, how to use them, um, how to plant them, where to site them, and a little bit about propagation, all of that kind of thing. So there are lots of things to cover. And, um, and as Nora said, uh, yeah, I'm representing the Mid-Atlantic Peony Society. So when I say maps, that's what I'm referring to, the Mid-Atlantic Peony Society and also the Scott Arboretum. And I'll tell you a little bit about how those are connected and, um, and why I'm doing both for peonies. So um, the world of peonies goes way back, the cultivated peonies. And it's thought that the, the Chinese had been cultivating peonies for actually a couple thousand years. Um, and so when we start talking about uh, the, the peonies that we're growing in our gardens today, um, really, they have been selecting and hybridizing for, for hundreds of years uh, when it comes to peonies. Uh, so there's always this representation. It was considered the imperial flower in uh, the court uh, in China. And they've been part of art and art history. Um, Tiffany, it was a favorite subject of Tiffany. So here a Tiffany lamp, and then this is a large Tiffany window that I have uh, some, some close up images showing peonies. So there's a long history. Um, it's a plant that many of us are familiar because it was a pass along plant. Uh, the herbaceous peonies, someone would have growing, they would dig it at some point, divide it, and then pass them along. Uh, so they're a good, hardy, tough plant like that. I'm going to go into just a little bit of um, taxonomy here. Um, I'm, it's just going to be just a couple of images, to, and then we'll get, o get over that and move on. But uh, peonies are in the family Peoniaceae. Um, and in that family, uh, we have the genus Paeonia. Um, and under the genus Paeonia, there are four subgenera and 25 species. Now, as with all um, botanists and taxonomists, this is a debated thing, uh, as with most plant groups. There are some that list up to 33 species and some even a little bit more. Um, but uh, the the kind of the phylogeny that I'm going to show you is taken from uh, uh, a certain uh, person, Joseph Haldeck, and I'll uh, talk about that in just a little bit. But typically, the peonies that we grow in the gardens, um, not so much the species ones, although we can, and I'll talk just a little bit about those, but we typically grow the herbaceous peonies, um, or shrub peonies, some people call them. We also grow the tree peonies, or woody peonies. And then the intersectional hybrids, or also called Ito hybrids. Uh, and those basically are a resultant uh, cross from tree peonies and herbaceous peonies. So a crossing of herbaceous with a woody peony. And I'll be talking about all those three groups and their use and give you some, uh, some nice pictures and examples of them. 
So this is a phylogenetic tree of the genus Paeonia. So if you look down at the base of the tree, we see the genus Paeonia, but this is uh, in the family Paeoniaceae. You see there's also the genus Glossidium, which branches out down near the base. Uh, and then we have a couple of uh, subgenera as you go up, uh, the subgenera for Mouton, which is over at the bottom to the left. And this is the group of woody peonies or tree peonies. And so you can see it's in, divided into section Mouton and then section uh, Delavanae. Uh, and then if you go up to the right of the tree, that's a subgenus Paeonia. And these would be the herbaceous. Um, and so we'll be talking just a little bit about these. Um, and basically it is crosses of some of these that are the resulting uh, garden plants that we grow today for herbaceous peonies. This is kind of uh, one uh, one one botanist thinking of uh, what these are. And this is uh, uh, Joseph Halda and James Waddick. Uh, this was uh, from their book uh, and how they divided things. So you can kind of see the numbers. Those are the species that are listed. So as I said, in their system, there are 25 different species. Um, that whole first uh, part under subgenus Paeonia, these are all the various species and subspecies of herbaceous peonies. And then if you get over to the right-hand column, about half the way down, you see subgenus Mouton. So Mouton is the section for the woody peonies or tree peonies. And then you go down and you see a number of species there. Uh, so Fruticosa, de de Decomposita, uh, Delavei, Ludia, and Potaninii. Um, it's actually very recently debated that Fruticosa is not a true species, but it is basically a group of hybrids or selections over the past 2,000 years. Uh, and so in the wild, there does not exist Paeonia sofruticosa. Uh, so as I said, this is uh, part of what the botanists uh, like to argue about, um, but I'm just kind of showing you a little bit of example of how all this fits together. Just a little bit about site selection for when we're growing uh, peonies. Uh, we'll look at tree peonies here first, and then I'll give you some examples. So basically peonies want good drainage. Uh, that is probably the most critical thing for them. If you plant them in an area where water is going to stand after rain, the peonies just aren't going to do well, and eventually they'll just die. Uh, or they'll just be very weak and not, uh, not grow very well. Tree peonies are best grown where there's they have partial shade in the middle of the day. And this really is for the time of flowering so that the flowers last longer. So many of you have probably seen images from China or Japan in tree peony gardens where they use the little umbrellas over the uh, peonies. And that's to do the same type of thing. Uh, the peonies would really love to grow in full sun, but if you do that um, when you have these big uh, blossoms coming out, the blossoms are going to fade in, in two or three days. It's going to bleach the color and they just aren't going to last as long. So if you have somewhere where there would be partial shade in the middle of the day, so a really high canopy tree, but they're still getting plenty of sunlight uh, through the rest of the day, that would be ideal for them. They want a good garden soil that has organic matter incorporated into it, and they prefer to have a pH near neutral. So somewhere between a pH of six and seven would be ideal for them. And they want minimal root competition. And I'll be saying this about the other peonies too. Um, a, a note about the pH. Um, I uh, grew up in central Pennsylvania in a limestone valley. So our soils were limestone. And that really was peonies grow so much better there than they do here, but it's the limestone soil. And so having that pH, uh, the natural pH of between six and seven, and you know the higher, the, when you get a pH that's closer to neutral, then there are many nutrients in the soil that become more available to the plant than if they're in acidic soil. Um, and there it was uh, basically a limestone clay and the peonies did just beautifully, herbaceous as well as tree peonies. Uh, and I'll show you some pictures of some peonies in that area. Um, but so before you plant your peonies, make sure you do check the pH and do some adjusting if you need to. And a little bit later on, I'll talk about specific things with planting. 
Now for the herbaceous and the intersectionals or the Ito hybrids, they want many of the same things, the good drainage, the good garden soil, pH near neutral, minimal root competition, but these really want a full sun location. Um, the, uh, the flowers tend to be uh, a bit uh, hardier, a bit tougher. Uh, they tend not to bleach as much uh, in the full sun, except for possibly some of the herbaceous hybrids. There are some of the earlier flowered ones that will, um, the flowers will change color over the days. Uh, but basically very similar conditions, but uh, the herbaceous intersectionals really want full sun. So let me go through the group of herbaceous peonies first. So here's just a... Uh, um, we have a, a old peony field uh, on campus, and this is part of Dr. Wister's um, did work with peonies. He had written a book about peonies, and Dr. Wister was the first director of the Scott Arboretum and was director for many, many years. Uh, and so it's really because of him that we have this, um, this history of peonies on campus. He was very involved in the American Peony Society at that time. Uh, he did some selecting and some hybridizing. Uh, he brought in the first tree peonies that started our collection, and that would have been around 1930, 1931, when he brought them. And we still have some of those plants today. Uh, and then he also had fields of uh, herbaceous peonies, as well as some other groups of plants. And we still have remnants of some of these fields today. So these are just some assorted ones that I collected in that field. Okay, so herbaceous peonies that we grow in the garden, you can kind of divide them into two different groups. And if you look in the good nursery catalogs, they will tell you what they are, although they usually don't separate them completely this way. But they would just be a listing of herbaceous peonies. If you read the description, which is usually alphabetical order, then it would tell you if they are lactiflora or if they are hybrid herbaceous peonies. So the difference between the two, there's a species, uh, Paonia lactiflora, and so the lactiflora uh, herbaceous ones are um, are more common. Uh, those are, these are kind of the old. Um, many of them are like the old fashioned ones that have been growing, you know, in your grandmother and great grandmother's garden. Um, and the they are hybrids uh, utilizing Paonia lactiflora. Okay, the uh, other ones, the hybrid herbaceous peonies typically use many of the other species of herbaceous peonies uh, in their background. Um, so the lactiflora herbaceous, they're the most common ones available. Uh, they're native to China, and most of the, most peony species are native to China, although uh, you're going to find them throughout Asia, uh, and actually Western North America has some species uh, of peonies native there. Um, the uh, lactiflora peonies typically produce some side flower buds. So on the stalk that comes up, it ends in a big main flower. You're going to have some side shoots with smaller flowers there. The um, hybrid herbaceous typically produce just one flower per stem. Um, by incorporating some of these other species of peonies in the hybrid herbaceous, we end up with a wider color range of uh, color range of blossoms um, in the hybrid herbaceous. And I'll show you in some images of that. Um, the, the foliage is different from the lactiflora foliage. And many of these hybrid herbaceous peonies typically bloom a little bit earlier than uh, the lactiflora peonies. So here's just a kind of a collection. If you look at uh, many of the ones on the left, these are some of the um, hybrid herbaceous peonies. And the ones on the right are lactifloras. Um, the, uh, that kind of color of salmon or peachy color, you would not typically have in lactiflora. Lactifloras are going to be kind of the, um, the raspberry purple, um, kind of a, a deep red that has a little bit of a blue in it, uh, white, and then pinks. Uh, but then with the other uh, ones, the hybrid herbaceous, you end up with uh, uh, many more pastel colors, uh, bright corally pinks, um, sunset colors of oranges and peachy colors and all of that sort of thing. So those are some of the uh, differences between the lactifloras and the hybrid herbaceous. There are also a lot of different flower types. And here you can kind of see uh, the uh, the double form of uh, of some of the uh, herbaceous peonies. Um, the ones you're looking at, these are all a uh, lactiflora hybrid. 
uh, in Big Bend. So here you can see this is uh, one that's been around probably from the 1940s or so. Um, big double flowered so you can see that you really can't see the sexual parts in the middle of it and uh, over the years this was looked at as being really desirable for cut flower uses and everyone probably has had the experience of using some of the really really old varieties and these are varieties from the late 1800s or so they were really for cut flower production if you grow them in your garden when they get wet or they get too open too much uh, they flop down uh, just because they get so heavy so those would uh, typically would have been staked if they were using for cut flower production. Um, here's just a, a one of the diagrams showing some of the different uh, flower types. And sometimes they go by a little different uh, names than just what you see here. Usually we have a single, sometimes um, the lotus and chrysanthemum are listed as your know, Japanese forms. Uh, we have the anemone form. And then we start getting into the semi-double and double types, like you see down at the bottom, and then a crown, and sometimes also called a bomb. Uh, the globular can also be called a bomb type. Um, this really depends, if you look at like the what's listed in the middle row for anemones or for uh, sometimes listed as the Japanese type of flower, You the sexual parts um, where you would have... Um, the uh, stamens and the carpels in the middle, they take on some other form. So they aren't, uh, they don't, they can't reproduce from those parts anymore, but they end up looking more like uh, remnant petals, sometimes called petaloids or sepaloids. Um, and so those are uh, really attractive in flowers. And I'll show you some examples um, of what I mean in that in just a minute. So here is a one that would be considered to be fully double. If you kind of peel those petals away in the very middle, there you can see some of the sexual parts there. So you're actually looking at the yellow stamens here in the middle, and but you're still the female parts are still kind of covered up by the petals. So what has happened when the um, flower becomes double like this? There are more and more petals, and usually fewer and fewer sexual parts in them. Um, here's one of our outings from, uh, this might have been from last year, from the Mid-Atlantic Peony Society, from MAPS, and we were visiting the collection at Winter Tour. And we're looking at all herbaceous peonies right here. So you can see some that are single, some that are semi-double right in through here. And usually the singles and semi-doubles would be flowering a bit before um, the fully double ones. And I'm just going to just give you a couple of examples of some different types here. Uh, I'm not going to say here are the best ones for you to grow, but we are going to talk about how you might select which ones you feel are best for you. So here's an example of Ellen Cowley. So um, as you can see, this is one that you can see from the various blossoms here. They've opened at different times. So you get this whole range of color from a really kind of strong, vibrant pink to a really pale pink, and then to almost going to kind of a whitish pink um, as it gets uh as the blossom ages. Um, Scytheria, and you might say, well, that looks very similar to the one before. Um, it's actually not, but they were both done by the same hybridizer. These were both done by Saunders. And so this was a combination of Paonia lactiflora by Paonia peregrina. And so he ended up with similar plants, but they aren't uh, exactly identical. Uh, but the, the blossoms when they're first open do look pretty similar. This is crinkled white, um, and uh, this is it would be a single blossom. So you can see that single row of petals around there, and really displaying the uh, the sexual parts very very clearly. Uh, and you can see this is a lactiflora type. If you look in the middle, you can see, okay, here's the main stem with the blossom, but then all of these side buds or side shoots coming off of it will flower later. Sometimes if these are used for cut flower production, they would disbud these uh, side shoots earlier. And then it typically makes more energy for the one flower at the end. Uh, so it might be larger, have a stronger stem. This is soft salmon joy. Uh, soft salmon joy is a uh, very early flowered. Uh, this one uh, at this stage, this is May 9th. And if we talk about kind of the, the period of flowering, for the herbaceous ones that we're talking about now, um, we could have these anywhere from 
there, there could be some of the earlier species that are in April, but the majority when we start getting into the um, herbaceous hybrids and the lactiflorus are going to be in May. And we usually we figure peak would be around the third to possibly fourth week of May for these. Uh, some of the later varieties would extend into June. And of course, that's going to vary depending on how late spring was in coming, how warm the spring was, and all of that type of thing. But typically, we were going to say May, uh, the middle to late part of May for peak flowering for herbaceous peonies. And then here is coral sunset. So this is one of the uh, herbaceous hybrids. So it flowers a bit earlier. And this is here in, uh, in the Rose Garden at the Scott Arboretum. Um, and uh, once again, it has those colors that you typically don't get from Paeonia lactiflora. So you can see some of the older blossoms in the image on the right are almost kind of creamy white looking uh, or a little bit of yellow in them. Uh, then you get to the really pale kind of corally peach color. And then you can see when the blossoms first open, like the image on the left, they are a stronger um, uh, salmon-y pink color. Okay, advance. There we go. Um, I, I said about uh, the suggestions for what peonies for you to grow. Um, if you look on the website for the American Peony Society, there is one, um, one thing that you can find, the Award of Landscape Merit, um, and there's the web address for it. This is going to list herbaceous and intersectional hybrid peonies that the society feels uh, offer superior, superior ornamental value, good appearance throughout the growing season, reliable performance across North America, and they have self-supporting flowers. Basically, you don't have to stake them. They have really strong stems. They're not going to grow up and flop. Uh, so it's a good place to go and just see you know, what some of the ones that they recommend are. Um, and for someone new to peonies, the, I would say these would be some of the best ones to really start with. As you start getting more into it, then you might want to have something where you're looking for really good fragrance, or you're looking for a double flowered or you want something that's going to flower very late to extend the season or something very early to extend it on the other end. Uh, so those are all kinds of other things. Or maybe you're just really partial to pinks and you want to have pinks, or you like some of the new salmon colored ones. Uh, but this is a good place to start to really uh, begin to, to learn about peonies. And especially for someone beginning to um, work with some ones that are really good performers. Oh, and I would put this image in here because uh, one of the questions that we get most often are peonies and ants. Uh, typically, you will find ants around uh, herbaceous peonies. Usually, you don't find them on the buds of uh, tree peonies. And uh, the ants are, are not hurting the plant. And no, the flower does not have to have ants on it for the flower to open. Uh, we've heard that one too. Uh, the ants are just there because you can see where the sepals are covering the bud. Um, there's a sweet sticky material, um, basically some of the sap from the plant that exudes along the edge there. So the ants are just there getting a free meal. Um, so they're, uh, they don't, they're, the flower doesn't require them. The ants don't require that. Uh, it's just a free meal. And so there's just something that's uh, beneficial for the ants to be there. I do want to talk about um, one species here um, because this is an unusual one. This is we commonly call the woodland peony. Um, and this is uh, Paeonia abaveda, subspecies japonica. Uh, you might also grow straight Paeonia abuveda, which is going to be a pale pink, and it's a bit taller. Um, this one, uh, subspecies japonica, will get probably oh, 12 to 16 inches tall. Abuveda might get up to 20, 22 inches tall. Um, flowers in April. Uh, for me, it's typically flowering um, maybe around the second week of April. Um, and uh, it stays low. And it has these sweet little white blossoms on it, not terribly large or single blossoms. They can be very fleeting if we have warm weather or if they get too much sun. But this is a peony that really will grow in shaded conditions. Um, once again, you still need to have good drainage, so good woodland conditions. Here I have them in my garden growing underneath a Franklinia and right up to the base of the tree. 
Um, and there you can see one down in the bottom because some of these are self-sown. It has a little bit of that pink in. So I'm getting a little bit of the, uh, the species coming out in that little bit of pink. Um, and uh, they're, they're really a nice little plant. Uh, and an interesting thing is in the summer, the uh, because I don't deadhead these, the seed pod will look like this, which is really attractive. Um, all of that bright red, that magenta red, those are all um, unfertilized seeds. So those are not going to grow into anything. But those uh, bluish black seeds, those are the fertile ones. Um, you can take those, you could plant them. Uh, in my garden, the squirrels will collect those seeds. They do the planting for me. And then I have them popping up all over the place. Uh, it's certainly not an invasive plant, um, but here they are. And so the stepping stones in the path just adjacent to there, these uh, larger three-leafed plants that you see, two of them here in between the stones, those are the seedling um, woodland peonies. Um, if the squirrels put the seeds out in the lawn, I will see these coming up in the spring. And these actually will emerge before the grass really starts getting growing. So in late March, um, I will see these in the lawn and I can just go through with a little trowel and prick them out and then plant them into the garden. Um, usually at our fall events for Mid Atlantic Peony Society, we sell seed of this. Uh, it's very easy to grow from seed. Okay, let's talk now about the intersectional hybrids or the ETO hybrids. So these are the cross between um, the uh, herbaceous peonies and tree peonies. So uh, what it results in is a really attractive mounding shrub of plant of a uh, plant that is covered with blooms. The foliage resembles tree peony blossoms, although you don't get the height that you might get with tree peony blossoms. So most of these intersectionals are going to be a really well-mounded cushion plant, um, cushion shape and they uh, might get anywhere from two to three feet high uh, in general. Now, different uh, cultivars are going to vary a little bit, um, but the flower is going to resemble more of the variety that we can get in herbaceous peonies. In tree peonies, we're fairly limited, as I'll show you a little bit later, uh, but th this gives a whole different color range and a different type of habit to it. Typically, the stems uh, of um, the intersectional hybrids produce one flower, so one large flower, so they're really good for cutting. Um, and um, they've uh, only been around really, I think the first ones were done in the 1960s, but it really wasn't until the 1980s when they were available uh, for sale. So we have a whole range of colors. I'm just going to show you a few as we go through. This is the, this pale uh, yellow here is going bananas. Here's Singing in the Rain. This is Hillary. Cora Louise. I think both Hillary and Cora Louise, the flower looks more like a tree peony flower than it does herbaceous. And this is Bartzella, which was one of the most popular ones at the very beginning. Uh, one of the, the best first yellows to come out. Um, this was really important for the Dutch cut flower uh, industry. Um, they were kind of growing all the Bartzellas that they could get for cut flowers. And this is pink double dandy. So there are quite a few different species, uh, or excuse me, quite a few different cultivars of these intersectional hybrids available. And they really do have hybrid vigor. Uh, when we talk about planting, basically, as with other ones, you're going to start with a division in the fall, uh, maybe a two or three or four eyed division with part of the root system. And really, within two years of planting in the fall, you're going to have a really nice sized plant at that time. So they do have the hybrid vigor uh, from the, the two different uh, the, between the two different uh, groups of uh, herbaceous peonies and tree peonies. Now let's talk about tree peonies. So this is kind of what uh, got started at the Scott Arboretum when I said, I said around uh, 1930, 1931. And so here you can see part of our tree peony collection. So the collection had been in various places of campus. And when I first started there a number of years ago, 
there was one part of the collection, it was uh, in one area of campus, it was going to be impacted by some construction. So I needed to learn about peonies and moving them, you know, rescuing them, uh, lifting them, dividing them, planting them in a new area. Uh, which ones do we had duplicates that we which ones should we save which ones could we deaccession um mrs wister gertrude wister was still alive and it was her husband who uh really was the peony aficionado but gertrude had worked with the peonies for you know all of her adult life um, along with dr wister so she was very very knowledgeable and she was able to help me out um, in educating me about the peonies so here's you know, part of our collection that we have down below the, the bell tower and uh, Sproul uh, Observatory. Uh, this is part of our collection that is up in um, the Harrywood Courtyard Garden. Uh, this is a, one of our earliest flowering ones. This is um, uh, Kyushu Caprice, um, so a, uh, a newer hybrid one. Uh, big pink flowers, you can kind of see a pale pale pink around the outer edges. Tree peonies, uh, as we say, these, these are the woody peonies. They're not going to grow into a tree, even though we call them tree peonies. Uh, they're going to be a woody shrub anywhere probably from 30 inches up to six feet tall. Uh, and it's going to depend on the cultivar, how large they're going to get. They typically have three different shapes to them. Uh, they can be very uh, erect, upright. For the stems, you just kind of grow up at an angle, so almost kind of a vase shaped when they're mature. They can kind of be a uh, rounded, complete shrub, as you can kind of see uh, in this image. There is here is one plant on the right. Here is another one on the left. Here in the foreground, you see the one with the foliage. It's a little bit different. This is a different cultivar that's going to be flowering later. You can see it's still in tight bud. But th this is Kyushu Caprice here. So these would, I would say, would be kind of that rounded mounding shrub. Uh, and then depending on the cultivar, they could be various heights. And then the last one is like a low mound. So it's going to get wider than it does tall. And it's going to stay probably below three feet tall. So kind of the three different um, growth habits to them. Okay, so as I said, they are we call them tree peonies, but they're not really a tree. They're a woody shrub, um, and many places list them as Peonia fruticosa, but in reality, they really are just Peonia hybrids, because there are a lot of different um, tree uh, woody species that go in for these. And as I said, these have been selected and bred for hundreds of years. Uh, and so until we do genetic testing of all of these, you know, we really aren't going to know which species that they really derive from. <clears throat> so uh, here are some of the different species that uh, are native uh, to China. Uh, the Composita, Gisonensis, Ostei, Qei, Rockii. Uh, many of you might be familiar with Peonia Rockii. Um, later on, these hybrids were crossed with uh, Peonia Delavei. Uh, which is a yellow to give us some of the uh, yellow colors in tree peonies or give us some of the lighter orange or some of the very, really light, light pink colors. This is the rocky eye. So rocky eye is a species and there are even selections of this. Um, you know, some people call this Joseph Rock peony. Um, you can typically tell uh, rocky eye if you look at the base of the petals, you see usually a deeper maroon, almost to black color. This is called a flare. And so when you see those flares, um, that is uh, an indication that it's uh, of rocky eye type. So it could be the rocky eye species or it could be selection of that. Um, I have a whole book uh, in Chinese on Chinese rocky eye hybrid uh, peonies. So um, the as I say, peonies are still very important uh, plant in China, uh, and they continue to release uh, new ones all the time using rocky eye. So um, for tree peonies, as we said before, you know, um, different types of the type of growing condition, they want, you know, higher pH between six and seven, well-drained soil, high in organic matter. The uh, peonies all are really hardy, so down to zone four. So some of our best growers are in northern Wisconsin, colder areas like that, even Maine can do well with them. Um, 
Ideally, you know, the tree peonies, if they have shade midday, the blossom's going to last longer. All peonies, once they're established, are really, really drought tolerant. <clears throat> this is a Japanese variety. So at some point, uh, peonies made their way to Japan. So they've still been, they were in Japan for, for hundreds of years, certainly not as long as China, where they're native to. Uh, but the Japanese did a lot of selecting on peonies also. So parts of our, the oldest part of our collection, we have uh, mainly Japanese varieties. Chinese cultivars and selections from China didn't really start coming into the market until, oh, the early 1990s. And then we started getting a lot of different Chinese cultivars that we have a, a fairly good collection of those here at the Scott Arboretum also. Um, but this is cow, which is a Japanese variety. And usually if I'm going to say, okay, what's the difference between all of these? The Chinese ones, for the most part, at least all of the cultivars that we grow tend to be the first to flower. And then they'd be followed by the Japanese uh, selections of tree peonies. And then they'd be followed by the other hybridizers. So we have a really large collection of Saunders hybrids, and I'll talk about these in just a, a minute, and I'll, I'll show you some examples of those. So um, all peonies, typically, you plant in the autumn. So we're talking about September, October. If you're buying a tree peony, you should get at least a three-year-old plant. Um, you want to have a planting hole that's about two feet by two feet. Uh, do your amending if you need to amend it with some organic matter, et cetera. Uh, figure on planting your plants at least five feet apart. Um, and normally the peonies that you're going to get are going to be grafted. And I'll talk about propagation a little bit later, and I'll show you what we mean by grafted and what it is doing that way. But um, um, woody peonies typically are not propagated from cuttings, but they're from grafting. Uh, so you want to pay attention to where that graft union is. Uh, you want to water it well after it's planted, and you want to mulch it for the first winter to really protect it. It's going to be sending out roots. So you could use a really light leafy mulch of up to eight inches. And then after that first year, peel some of that away, uh, allowing just like two to three inches of the mulch to remain. So it'll just help protect it in that first winter. Fertilizing. This is, uh, it's under the tree peony section, but this really goes for all the peonies when we talk about planting. Um, don't use any um, high, um, high intensity fertilizer to time of planting because peony roots are very, very fine when they first start growing out. And if you have uh, too much fertilizer there, you can just burn those new roots. Um, but you could add some phosphorus or bulb fertilizer, a uh, slow release bulb fertilizer or organic bulb fertilizer uh, at that time. And you could, you definitely want to make sure you adjust pH and you want to add some organic matter into the soil. In the second and succeeding years, um, use bulb fertilizer. I typically use an organic one and it's going to break down slower. It's going to be a slow release. Or you could use two to four ounces per plant of 5-10-10 or 10-10-10. And usually apply this as a split application. So put it on in late winter and then at the time of flowering. Watering for a newly transplanted plant. Um, you want to keep it watered regularly if we have a really dry spell for the first several seasons. Um, after that, they should only require watering um, if it is really, really dry conditions. Peonies can really handle uh, drought really pretty well. We want to make sure that your plants are good and mature and established uh, before letting them fend for themselves. But do not overwater peonies. So once again, here's some of our collection. It is on a slope, so we never really have a danger of uh, these plants getting too much water. And you can see we have them uh, in different bed areas. And if you come and look, we have a map saying that each bed has its own number uh, and we have them grouped differently. So there's a bed that has the Chinese tree, tree peonies, a couple of beds of Japanese tree peonies. And then we have um, some of the other ones, as I said, the uh, Saunders hybrids. Uh, and then we also have some other hybridizers, their plants uh, listed. <clears throat> this is one of the Japanese varieties, a really unusual one. This is Shima Nishiki, and it has this variegated red uh, and white. 
and then you get some of this striping that occurs through it. The, um, if you start with a new plant of this, they might be all red to begin with. And until they have been established three to four to five years, they, then they will start taking on this uh, typical variegated uh, color for the blossom. This is Ezra Pound. So this is one of the uh, um, later hybrids. So you can see here's a tree peony that uh, they really take advantage of the frilly petals, but also see those deep red flares or maroon flares. That means there's a bit of rocky eye in its heritage somewhere. This is Narcissus, and this is one of the Saunders hybrids. So AP Saunders did a lot of hybridizing on peonies. And um, over the years, um, he had these different groups. So he did a lot with yellows. So Narcissus is probably the palest yellow. Um, and then there are some other stronger yellows like Roman gold and high noon. Um, he has uh, some other ones. This is Black Panther. So this is one of his probably one of this and Black Pirate, the most deep, dark maroon color uh, that you could get. So these are some of the Saunders hybrids. Um, the, some of the Saunders work was taken up by another hybridizer, Nasus Daphnis. And so Gauguin is a Daphnis hybrid. So uh, um, Daphnis is a was a uh, Greek artist who became really interested in peonies and peony hybridizing for tree peonies. So he was taking things a little step further. So if you look at his cultivars, uh, many of them have this frilly edge to the petals. They usually have some streaking of other colors through the petals. So here is basically, it's a yellow petal that has this red running through it. Uh, and so you might get this darker edge along it, a Picotty deep colored edge. Uh, Gauguin is one of my top three peony cultivars. I just really, really like the blossom. It's a good grower for me. The flowers aren't huge. The flowers here are probably, oh, five to six inches in diameter. Other ones can get, you know, eight inches or so in diameter. But I think it's a really attractive plant, and I really like that flower color. This is Elizabeth Blair Hirsch, um, one of the other later hybrids uh, of tree peonies. <clears throat> And this is Chinese Dragon. So Chinese Dragon is another of um, Saunders hybrids. Uh, has a really different foliage on it. You can see how uh, dissected the foliage is. And also when the buds break in the spring and the foliage first starts coming out, it is a deep maroon color. And you can kind of see that on some of the leaves. It still has a little bit of that maroon in on the leaves. Um, I said that uh, I was going to show you a picture of what uh, peonies grow like in central Pennsylvania. So this is uh, Julie Jenny. Many of you knew Julie, who is, uh, she was our educational coordinator here at Scott Arboretum. We were visiting Franklin Chow uh, in Center County. And uh, Franklin is in one of the, the valleys there, very close to where I grew up. And it's good limestone soil. And he breeds peonies. So he's breeding uh, basically Chinese uh, peony, selections of Chinese peonies. And here you can see at his property, all these rows of peonies that are growing there. Um, these are some right up next to the house where he lives. And so uh, he has he's looking for various things. So you're gonna see all different kind of stature of plants, all different size of blossoms, um, but he has some really, really beautiful plants uh, at his property. So you can see in the background there, are some of the ones that are very, very upright growing, other ones that are more mounding. He's growing all these out in full sun um, because, I mean, he he wants to get full sun. He wants good growth out of them. Uh, and he's using these for hybridizing. So care uh, for tree peonies, uh, they do require a little bit of pruning, um, but these are, you know, for herbaceous peonies, in the autumn, you're going to cut those stems down to the ground and remove them from the garden. For tree peonies, you don't. If you cut them down to the ground, then you're never going to get blossoms <laughs> because you'd be cutting the blossoms right there. They flower on old wood. So in uh, for tree peonies in pruning in late winter and early spring, you're going to cut out the dead branches. Or if you have a really old plant, you might want to remove uh, one or two of the old branches to encourage some young ones to come up. You know, just like a, a lilac, if the stem gets too old at some point, it's just not going to be as productive for flowers anymore. 
Um, and typically the branches of tree peonies are going to die back a little bit at the tip. So you're going to tip them back to live buds. So it's a minimal amount of pruning you do then. And after flowering, you do want to deadhead the blossoms. If you leave the uh, uh, blossom remnants there, it's going to be trying to produce seed. If that's your goal, that's fine. But other than that, that's going to be taking energy away from flower buds for next year. Because the flower buds for the following season are going to be set in um, in late summer. So you need to make sure that you do the deadheading so that you get a good flower set for the next year. After your pruning in early spring, this is what it's going to look like. And these buds of peonies are going to start swelling in March. <laughs> so that's typically when you're going to be out there and doing the pruning. Here you can see in the background, the winter aconites are um, coming up. Oh, and I noticed this morning I had my first winter aconite flowering in my garden outside the front door. So I'm getting close to that time where I need to look at the tree peonies and see if they need to be pruned. Um, we'll talk now about uh, pests of peonies. Uh, in tree peonies, you can get a peony borer. borer. It's not um, a, a major problem. But if you're going to see a branch that dies back and wilts, you know, an individual branch that might have a borer in it, uh, and you just cut it back to healthy tissue. Sometimes these older branches, just because they get old, they can kind of wilt when it gets to be summer, uh, just because you know, the branch is partially uh, beginning to die along it. So just cutting it back to healthy tissue is all that you need to do for that. Uh, gray mold and bud blight is going to affect any kind of peony. This is caused by um, any number of species of botrytis. And this uh, typically happens when we have a lot of really wet, humid weather, warm weather in the springtime. And you'll see this gray mold that might cover the buds. Uh, it will cover the flowers. It could be on the uh, tissue, the petals of the flower as the flower begins to fade. So you want to make sure that you keep it clean. Uh, as I say, the big problem is occurring in, in wet, humid, uh, warm springs. The uh, botrytis are going to overwinter in the dead foliage because it will affect uh, the foliage. So you do want to make sure that you're practicing good sanitation in, in the peonies. So when those leaves come off, rake them up and get rid of them. Uh, do not allow the leaves to remain under the peonies. So this goes for tree and herbaceous peonies. As a last resort, they used to recommend fungicide sprays. We never use fungicide sprays on any of our peonies here, but we try to be pretty careful about making sure that we're running a, a clean, clean operation and getting rid of any of the foliage that might have that. Also, uh, powdery mildew. This is usually, uh, whoops, the powdery mildew usually is more of a problem in um, on herbaceous than on tree peonies, although tree peonies could get it. So for many peonies, once you get to mid to late summer, you might start seeing symptoms that look like this. So this is um, some of the uh, botrytis, most likely, where you see some of these lesions on some of the flowers. There also are a couple of other just foliar lesions, um, and it really depends on what the weather is like. And this is why you want to make sure that you clean up that old foliage or stems and get rid of it. And here is the powdery mildew. As they say, normally this is going to be more of an issue with herbaceous peonies. And so um, when you start seeing this, and, and they're going to vary. Uh, in my mind, I tend to have more of an issue with powdery mildew on the um, herbaceous hybrid peonies than on the lactiflora herbaceous peonies. Um, some and It all depends on what the season is. Some seasons are really bad. Uh, many cultivars have really good resistance to it and get very little powdery mildew. But when it starts looking like the picture on the right and it gets to be the middle of September, okay, when it's like that, you might as well go ahead and cut those stems to the ground at that point, even though the stem's not really dying back yet. But it's not being effective to the plant at all, and you'll just get rid of that powdery mildew. <clears throat> After you do your pruning in the spring, this is what your tree peony should look like. So all cleaned up, <clears throat> the tips pruned back, good healthy buds uh, at the ends of all of the branches. Okay, so you have peonies. You, if you have um, herbaceous and intersectionals and you want to uh, move them, whatever, this is what you need to do. So here's an herbaceous peony. Um, 
for me, it's now early September. You can see the foliage is beginning to look a little bit ratty at this point. There's some other plants around it here, but just pay attention to the peony right there in the middle. I'm going to come in, I'm going to cut the stems back to the ground. So get all of that cleaned up like that, get rid of those stems. And then I use a spading fork and start digging around. So you can see just to the right of the spading fork, there are the stubs of the stems that I cut back right in that area. And then I just start using the fork, starting out maybe a foot from the clump and just start digging down and trying to basically, once I get that soil loosened up all around it, I just want to lift the base of that plant up through that soil like I'm doing right there. So there you can see the stems coming up. You can see the roots um, that I'm beginning to expose from the peony. And the roots are these tubers, which looks like uh, dahlia tubers um, or sweet potatoes on some of them. So this is the root system. Now, from these big, thick, fleshy roots, this is where all the food energy is going to be stored. But in the springtime, the peony and will fall, starting in the fall, the peony generates a lot of really tiny little feeder roots coming off of these big, thick, fleshy roots. So these big, thick, fleshy ones, this is where the food's going to be stored over winter. And it's the little feeder roots coming out. They're going to be absorbing the nutrients and the uh, water that's in the soil. So you get that out, kind of tease the soil off of that. Many times the clump will kind of break apart naturally. Uh, so it makes it easier for dividing. And you can kind of see what you wanna have. These white little globular things, these are the buds that are gonna be next year's stems. So you want to end up with sections where you have the bud attached to uh, a nice root system. Typically, you know, good nurseries that are gonna be selling these in the fall, uh, they're gonna sell anywhere from two to four eyes or buds uh, for each clump that you're going to get. Um, what I'm showing here, some of the roots you see might have some damage. They might you know, be partially rotted area. You wanna clean those up when you're, uh, before you replant this or when you're dividing it. So here you can see a piece that I lifted out and there I can see at least four eyes on this bit. So now I'm just ready to do some pruning to clean off some of the rotted parts or broken parts or damaged parts of the root system. So you can see here's one that I broke when I was digging. So I just need to do a clean cut on that so you don't have a ragged edge. Um, here you can see just past my pruners to the left in that lower picture, um, there's an old scar there on the upper left. Um, you can see part of that root is rotted at the end. So I'm just cutting those damaged parts away from the root system. So this is what I'm left with then uh, for the piece that I'm going to plant. And this is like what they would be doing at a nursery. Then for planting, for herbaceous peony, you want to go about a foot deep or so, about two feet wide. Do your amending with organic matter. Um, um, do add some limestone, um, and I usually add about one cup per plant. I know what the pH of my soil is, and it's always acidic, so I just do this as a matter of course. If you don't know, make sure you do a soil test in enough time so that you know what you need to do. Um, I will use a uh, slow release bulb tone, uh, organic bulb tone, and I'll put about one half to three quarters of a cup of this bulb tone in the hole along with the compost, along with the um, um, limestone, and then mix all of that up. I'll set the my division, that same division that you saw previously, I'm gonna set that down in, uh, settle it down into the soil. And the height of that, you wanna have the eyes about two inches below your finished soil surface. So here I have this uh, shovel handle running across and um, you can see it's about two inches below where that, that eye or that butt is. <clears throat> and then you just put in your amended soil, cover it up with that, uh, water it in there at the time of planting. Remember, I'm doing this in September and October, uh, and then label it. So if you know the cultivar, you want to make sure you keep track of where that is. So that's planting. So I just want to talk a little bit about different propagation methods. So I just showed you division. Um, peonies could also be grown from seed. So if you want to let a few uh, blossoms go to collect seed, um, you do that. They do have to go through a 
cold stratification period. So they need a warm, then a cold, then a warm. Um, and basically, you're going to, as soon as the seed ripens in late summer, you're going to sow it at that point uh, and get it in the ground. Uh, grafting uh, typically is done on tree peonies. It's not done on herbaceous. Herbaceous, basically, uh, they would all be divided from the from the, the root system. Uh, but uh, tree peonies are grafted, as I said, the main way for propagation. And that's done mid-August through September. And with tree peonies, you could also do some layering, basically just bending a branch down in the spring and pegging it in and then hoping that it's going to begin to set out some roots, and then eventually you can remove it from the plant. Grafting is unusual in tree peonies, where you're just taking a scion, or that top part, it usually just has one or two buds on it from, that, the, from the desirable cultivar that you want. And then you're using a root of an herbaceous peony, typically a lactiflora, lactiflora herbaceous peony. Uh, the problem is if you use a um, herbaceous hybrid uh, peony root, uh, that is really wants to grow on its own. And you can actually just from a piece of root, you could get a new plant to grow. Lactifloras then are much better um, for you be using uh, for that. And usually you want to have a root that is maybe about an inch to an inch and a half in diameter. And so here you can see what they do is they insert just that, that cyan part down into that root, wrap it up, heal it, and then that's what is going to grow. And then what it's going to look like, if it takes, here you can see on the left, this is the herbaceous root. And here is the where the graft was inserted uh, a year or so ago. And then this is what grew up in the following one to two years after that this upper part in here. And then you can see the tree peony is beginning to put out its own roots. So ultimately, this piece of herbaceous root is going to uh, disintegrate. Uh, it's, all the energy gets used up. It's really just used as what we call a nurse root. Um, we don't want it to begin to set up uh, buds and begin to grow. We really want the tree peony to begin to grow on its own. Uh, and it's going to set up its own root system and not use, utilize the herbaceous root system for more than two or three years. Here on the right, this is a little bit older tree peony uh, that we bought in. Here you can see what remains of the herbaceous roots. There was the graft inserted. These are herbaceous roots. And then here's the tree peony roots on its own. So the soil level would have been up here. So when you plant these, you want to have that graft union about four inches below the soil surface. Uh, and then this is where the new soil surface is going to be. So that's just going to be used for a nurse root. And there you can kind of see a close up of that. So with tree peonies, you can also divide them. Usually you just do that on older plants. Once again, that's done in September and October. So you can see all of this planting is all happening in the fall. Um, you typically garden centers are going to be selling peonies in the spring because people want to buy them when they're in flower. Um, you can you can do the planting then. Um, the problem is in the springtime, peonies are not putting out much in the way of new roots. They do that in the fall. And that's why we do all of these other digging, dividing and planting in the fall as a plant's beginning to go dormant. Even though the top part is dormant, the roots will be putting out all of those new little feeder roots. And so that's really helps get them established. Um, so I'm not saying don't buy peonies in the spring. Um, in the garden centers, that's when they're going to sell them. There aren't many places selling the, the roots in the fall, but that really is the best time to do it. If you do a mail order, that's when they're going to be doing. They're going to be shipping your uh, dormant roots in September, October, whether you're getting herbaceous peonies, the intersectional peonies, or tree peonies. And as I said, vegetative cuttings, rarely are they done. Uh, in China, they do that a little bit on some tree peonies. And here's a big old tree peony, which I lifted, um, and I would be dividing the plant at this point, just because I can. I don't have to, but I can. Uh, so just kind of teasing it apart uh, and then getting it established in a new location. <clears throat> I just want to show you a peony that I grew from seed. And this was all accidental. I didn't plan this at all. I had a tree peony close by here. Um, 
and most likely one of the seeds fell into this uh, stone wall that I have in my back garden. And this is the plant that resulted from it. And it's actually quite a nice one. It's a very upright growing, beautiful plants. This past year, the plant is about six years old now. Last year, I had more than 30 blossoms on it. And it is still growing out of this rock wall. So, um, so you can get some really interesting things from seed. So this was a, um, a really uh, broad topic. Uh, I couldn't spend a whole lot of time on any of the different groups. Uh, what you're looking at here, these are all herbaceous peonies. This was from one of our peony society meetings uh, where we just had people bring in and we were just kind of showing kind of the variety of peonies at that point. And for here, we we're trying to teach people about judging. Um, and so what is a good quality blossom and what isn't? Um, I just wanted to go over some last things now about where you where you could buy peonies. So uh, I just have these listed in uh, alphabetical order. Uh, so I'm not saying anyone is uh, better than the other. Uh, Adelman Peony Gardens. Uh, Adelman's always donate some really nice plants every fall for a Mid-Atlantic Peony Society. We have typically a dig and divide uh, uh, day and where we go out into the collection here at Scott Arboretum, and I demonstrate how to dig and divide peonies, and we always have a sale and auction. So Adelman's always donate some plants for that. Uh, Brandamore Specialties. Um, Brandamore is uh, local, uh, so they're in Chester County, uh, and then there you can see their site. Um, this is Matt, and he's uh, on our board of Peony Society. Cricket Hill Gardens uh, mainly has tree peonies, uh, and they really specialized in Chinese tree peonies. And so I had known them since the early 1990s when I was first getting into peonies. Uh, Eleanor Tickner, and I think Eleanor might be on this, uh, might be here in the audience today. Uh, Eleanor E.T. Flowers out in Gradyville, a great place to go see peonies in the spring. So check out uh, Eleanor's, and she also does selling of some herbaceous and tree peonies. Hollingsworth peonies, uh, this would be mail order. Um, Hollingsworth is in the Midwest. Peonies Envy over in New Jersey. <clears throat> they also have uh, open days and they also sell at the flower show. Uh, Solaris Farms, um, Solaris Farms owned by uh, Nate Bramer. Uh, Nate came and spoke to us um, uh, to, uh, last year, two years ago, sometime in the past two years. Um, he runs Solaris Farm. He's a peony hybridizer as well as growing peonies. Uh, and he mainly specializes in tree peonies, although he does have some herbaceous. And he is going to be coming to speak to us again. So some of tree peony event, or excuse me, peony events coming up soon. We have a tree peony tour at the Scott Arboretum along with the Mid-Atlantic Peony Society. That's on May 7th at 6 p.m. Um, we have a Peony Palooza at the Scott Arboretum. This will be our second annual Peony Palooza. We started last year. This is really uh, Matt's doing the, the majority of the work for it. I'll show you some pictures in just a minute of what the Peony Palooza is. But it's uh, several days of peonies in the Worcester Center at the Scott Arboretum. We have children's events and all kinds of things going on with it too. Uh, peony competition, flower arranging, everything. Uh, MAPS also has additional peony tours in the area, so May is a really busy month for the society. Um, the, uh, the peony tours, so these typically are member gardens or some public gardens after hours. Uh, you have to be a MAPS member in order to do that. Um, we have a tree peony grafting workshop. So I was talking about uh, tree peonies. We graft some of the most unusual varieties that you can't get. Um, at this workshop because we have donations of cyan wood from some of our members, from the Scott Arboretum, from Winter Tour Gardens, which has a good uh, uh, tree peony collection as well as herbaceous peony collection. So that's August 20th, and that is for MAPS members. <clears throat> Nate Bremer, which I mentioned, who I mentioned from Solaris Farm, he's going to be lecturing twice this coming fall. He's going to be at the Perennials Conference, which is co-sponsored by uh, Hardy Plant Society and Scott Arboretum and Longwood and Chanticleer and PHS. Uh, that's on October 18th. And then he's going to stay around that weekend. And so the next day, Saturday the 19th, he's going to give a talk for us at the Scott Arboretum. So this is going to be a free lecture open to the public 
uh, co-sponsored by MAPS, Confessions of a Hybridizer, where he's going to talk about his hybridizing and, uh, and his p &E work. And we'll also have a p and &E auction uh, at that time. So these are a few images from our p and &E Palooza last May. Uh, or first peony palooza. So on the left, this is an image of, you can see kind of red ribbons running through. We had different classes. Anyone is welcome to uh, ex bring in cut specimens and then they are judged um, for, for their show quality. And so we award ribbons and all of that kind of thing. We'll have information coming out about this um, uh, in April uh, and anyone is able to bring in peonies for this. And then the image on the right, you can see uh, the, the big flower arrangement was done by Adam Gloss, uh, one of our gardeners here at the Scott Arboretum. He's a garden supervisor, and he helps me out a lot with the, the p and &E events that we have. And then we had some flower arranging uh, competition also. Um, here is part of the flower arranging competition uh, for the, uh, the p and &E Palooza. And we ended up having over 300 people over the two days come and visit this event. And here are some of the other uh, classes of cut specimens uh, that were judged. Uh, and you can see, so we filled uh, the Worcester Center with peonies. So whether you want to participate or you just want to come and visit, um, make sure you make note of that. Um, so it's on the Scott Arboretum website, as well as the Mid-Atlantic Peony Society, which has a... A uh, whopping ten dollar per year membership, um, and so uh, you heard some of the events that we um, sponsor or co-sponsor. So visit us on our website or visit us on Facebook. Uh, membership application is on uh, the website, um, so you can do that or come to any of our events, and you can join at any of those too. Um, I asked Nora if it was okay that if I uh, do one other bit of publicity. Last year, I spoke uh, uh, to this group uh, on behalf of Clematis because of my role in that. We have a free webinar that's coming up um, on February 3rd, so this weekend. Uh, that's Saturday. We're trying to do this at Saturday uh, for people who can't do it during the week. It's at 1 p.m., uh, and it's going to be the legacy of Clematis Integrifolia an illustrated celebration of influential clematis. And it's going to be uh, presented by Linda Butler, who is at uh, near Portland, Oregon, and she's at the, the uh, curator of the Rogerson Clematis Collection, and Morris Horn, um, also from that neck of the woods. And Morris Horn had a wonderful nursery, just recently retired a couple of years ago from it uh, out there, and he's... Um, very, very knowledgeable in clematis. Uh, they were both in, involved in the International Clematis Society. Um, there is the Zoom link. So if you want to get out your phone and take a picture of that, that's all you really need uh, to have to join in. And once again, that program is at one o'clock this Saturday. So I'm going to leave that image up. And um, Nora, I'll take any questions. Oh, yeah. Well, we've got quite a few. Um... Hang on. I am glad that at the very beginning, a few people had some sound issues, but it was actually their computer and it quickly got resolved. So um, glad everybody got on board. Um, yeah. All right. So the first question is, I have a four-year-old tree peony and it's bloomed every year, but this year it sent up a herbaceous stalk. Um mm -hmm. I assume that's from Grafton Underground. What do I do? Um, you know, I have a couple in the collection that are notorious for doing that. When you see it come up, and you will be able to tell that the foliage looks very different, and it's a herbaceous stem, not a woody stem coming up. Just, I, I tried to reach down in with my hand as far as I can below the soil and just rip it out. Mm -hmm. um, if it is something that's going to happen... If it, it just say it keeps happening every year, you might want to lift that plant in September or October, <clears throat> cut off the herbaceous root that remains and replant it. Sometimes if you got in a, a grafted plant, if you planted it too shallow, too near the surface, then it will keep trying to send up shoots also. Yeah. All right. Um, we do have a recommendation to trim off the side buds on the herbaceous peonies. Uh, to strengthen the primary flower, is it required or what's your advice on that? I think you mentioned it in the program. Yeah. 
Yeah, uh, no, it's not required at all. Typically, that would only be done if you really want exhibition size blossoms or if you wanted to do cut flowers and you just want one big flower on the end of a stem. Uh, you could always do it uh, and keep the side buds. And if you use it for a flower arrangement, usually those side buds will begin to open also. So mm -hmm. it's a way of extending the, the flowering time by having the side buds remain. Oh, nice. Okay. So is there a coral cultivar that seems to hold its color the longest? Um, well, I think all of the corals, uh, they will all change. I mean, naturally change color. Um, I don't know that any are going to really hold that color the whole time. Okay. Um, and I'd be happy to hear from other folks if they've had other experience. You know, all of the ones that I have, they're in full sun and they all go through this kind of stage of progression so the the blossom color will change and it will begin to fade a little bit so i don't know that any will stay that pale salmony peach color the whole time right um i think you addressed this question in the course of your program about how you to prune a tree peony um so i think if you for folks because you're registered, you'll get the the recording of this and can review that again. Yeah, and basically um, all that it is is a little cleanup. So you want to cut this the tips of the stems back to where you have a good, uh, healthy bud. And on really old ones, uh, cut out an occasional old stem so you get some young, young new shoots coming up that'll be more floriferous. Okay. Um. Actually, this one comes from me. Uh, in the early 2000s, I got a uh, one of the first Edos that came out commercially from Pleasant Run, and it was called at the time Sequestered Sunshine. Yeah. Is that really Bartzella, or is that a different one that's just not out in the... I never no. see it. Yeah, yeah. No, no, it, it, is, a, it is a different one, different from okay. Bartzella. Yeah. And actually, there are, there are quite a few yellows. Um yeah, and many of them look very, very similar to each other. But if you look at them growing side by side, the growth habit is a bit different. The intensity of that little red flare at the base is a little different. The yellow might just be a little bit different from each other. Okay. All right. Well, good to know. Um, any mollusk, should it be grown in full sun? I've had it in part sun for a couple of years and it has never bloomed. Can you say the first part again? Peony mollus. Oh, okay. Mm -hmm. um, should it be grown in the full sun? I've had it in part sun for a couple of years and no blooms thus far. Yeah, it probably should be in full sun. Yeah. Okay. Yep. And again, this is something you were addressing in the course of the lecture about dealing with botrytis, um, including turning black at the end of the season. And she has not seemed to be able to control the problem. Mm -hmm. so yeah 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 and and also um sometimes we put our plants where they're too crowded by other plants so make sure it has good air drainage around it um so it, uh, the foliage will dry off faster okay yeah. what's the best way to divide peony tenufolia so that it should you don't lose the original plant um so, I mean, when I talk about peony dividing, you really don't have to divide peonies at all. I mean, they can go for decades and not, you know, you, you just wouldn't have to do it. So the only reason to do it is that you want more. So I'm guessing that's what you want to do. Mm -hmm. um, I I would not do it that frequently. So I wouldn't do it, you know, um, like you know, maybe every you know five years or so, because you really want to, to build up again. Uh, tenuifolia is not, you know, it's a smaller plant, not terribly vigorous. Uh, so make sure that when you do it, don't take uh, really small divisions. So maybe you dig your plant and maybe you just divide it into two or three. Um, so, so you're not going to make a bunch of money that way, but I'm guessing that's not what your <laughs> purpose is in doing that one. Yeah. Right. Okay. What is the difference between Delavaii and Ludia tree peonies in terms of color? Are they both mostly yellow? Question mark. Yes, yes, they're both yellow. Yeah. Uh, well, there you go. Uh, so, is there any other defining difference between the two? Um, some botanists would say yes. Some would say no. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah. Once again, uh, I would say 
uh, between the two defining difference. I mean, it really comes down to some really uh, minute things in the, and if you read in the description, so um, you see, I have that in, they do really good description of all of those in this book. Okay. All right. So th that's this was the book that I had listed earlier, uh, the genus Paonia by Joseph Halda and Jim Waddick. So it really does do a good description of uh, each of the species in there. All right. Um, there were some questions about powdery mildew. Again, I think you did very well discussing that in the course of the program. And I would um, never recommend spraying for it. Yeah. I mean, the the typically. I mean, if it's a cauliflower that just is just awful with it every year, well, then that's probably not the best cauliflower for you to be growing. There are many that have some resistance or will just get a little bit of powdery mildew. So I'd say just deal with it. Um, so this was a question about um, having growing a tree peony from seed, and they wanted to know if it would hold up as well as the grafted types. And she proceeded to add to it you answered the question in the course of the program <laughs> yeah yeah I mean, it should be it should be you know it, as far as its vigor and all that well you don't know because you don't know what the genetics are going to be so that's the thing with you know growing anything from seed like this you don't know exactly what it's going to be you don't know if it's going to be attractive you don't know if it's going to be better you don't know if it's going to be more vigorous until you actually do it and grow it yeah. Okay, so you whetted everybody's appetite. And, you know, I remember when you and Julie gave that program about your Penn State journeys, mm -hmm. and you mentioned Franklin Chow's garden. Is he, there's a question, does he sell retail? And if yes, where is he located? No, he does not sell retail. Oh, no. there you go. Well, that was short and sweet. Yeah. Uh, can you discuss a little more fern leaf peonies? Okay, so that's the tenuifolia. Yeah. So um, it's a little bit more difficult to grow. Um, actually, out in Lancaster and where I'm from in central Pennsylvania, it does beautifully because they have the limestone soil. Um, it You could consider it more of a rock garden type plant. It wants really good drainage. It would want full sun. Um, but typically, the foliage is probably going to go down in summer on it. So it doesn't have foliage that usually will last. Um, so uh, it, you know, just not being as large, it's not as vigorous. Um, I would say do all the things we said for ideal conditions. You know, full sun, good drainage. Make sure your pH is good. Uh, all of that kind of stuff. Right. Yeah. I think the best I ever saw of that particular uh, species was in Norway. They were stunned. oh really yeah uh, yeah actually good drainage. All Good drainage. All the peonies in Norway were stunning, and my jaw was dropping. Envy is a terrible thing. Um, what are the companion bulbs that are in, with the Scott tree peony garden bins? Um, we uh, have, uh, when, I'm just looking at the, let me just show you I have the next photo here. You can see we have, uh, this is in one of the Chinese beds. We have some of the later really small daffodils. Uh, I would never grow something like King Alfred or whatever. It's just going to be too competitive. Uh, but in most of the other ones, we will have uh, scillas and kinodoxas because it's a really small diminutive bulb. Remember, you don't want anything that is going to be providing too much competition to a plant. So I wouldn't want to put a bulb in here that's going to take over. Um, so I always question whether we should have put the narcissus in, but this is a smaller one and it's not going to get so terribly vigorous. Right. And fi finally, uh, should I cut the branches with Botrytis off a plant during midsummer or does that impact the entire plant? Uh, if the leaves are still good and green, I would leave them. Uh, once that you feel that it's re they're really unattractive, I would go ahead and cut it out. So you don't want to do it prematurely if you just see a little bit of it. If it's really affecting the amount of green leaf available to the plant, um, then um, then you have to make that decision. But you, once it, the, the leaf really starts going down, if it's really covered by the botrytis, then it's not really doing much good for the plant anymore either. But the important thing is really cut it out and get it out of the garden. Yeah. Great. 
Okay, um, there was a question about the seeds, but you've responded to that very well. And then um, I will reiterate the Clematis program is at 1 p.m. on Saturday, February 3rd. So someone was asking for the time and yep. there, there it is. Yep. Um, thank you, Jeff. We have learned quite a bit on Good. this program. And we're very grateful for you sharing your knowledge and spending the morning with the Hardy Plant Society. I All look right. forward to seeing everybody. And I think I will see you this weekend, Jeff. Yep, I will. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Thank you, right. folks. See you in a garden. Thank you. Have a good day. You too.